Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever and wherever you are watching this video. Today I'm presenting my work joined with Martino on how algorithms can sustain uh, collusive outcomes. So in the past couple of years, we have received a lot of media coverage on how algorithms and markets where algorithms are used to uh, set prices might actually be worse for consumers. Uh, this is not just a feature of online markets, it is also spreading to uh, real estate as well. And uh, all this explains why agencies and regulatory bodies have, have had a keen interest in understanding the causes that drive the outcomes of this uh, collusive uh, behavior, seemingly collusive behavior, and what can be done to address it. The theory of industrial organization generally divides, uh, classifies collusion in two types. You can have explicit collusion, which is the case where multiple firms that operate in the same market come together and uh, explicitly agree on some anti-competitive action. And they support these agreements by meetings and calls. And then we can have tacit collusion. Tacit collusion happens when there are implicit agreements uh, between firms that are supported by reputational effects that repeated interactions generate. And now we are seeing algorithmic collusion. Is, something, is it something completely new? Do we have any tools to deal with it? This is a particularly uh, relevant question because the theory of industrial organization has devised ways to make sure that collusion is minimized. Explicit coordination is outright banned by the Sherman Act that provides that competing firms should not talk to each other at any point. And even if tacit collusion is not expressly prohibited by any provision of law, uh, at least in the United States, there are tools that are used to prevent that uh, uh, the conditions to conducive to tacit collusion happen. So for example, we have merger approval to uh, prevent excessive concentration of the markets. But what if algorithmic collusion is actually something different? Uh, well, first of all, there is absolutely no regulation that provides mm, protection from spontaneous collusion, if it is uh, this is that's driving uh, algorithmic collusion. And what are, are there any of the tools that we are using for the explicit and tacit collusion going to work in this setting as well? Today, we will formalize a mechanism that's responsible for algorithmic collusion, and we are going to call it spontaneous coupling. It's going to be a coupling because it's actually a linkage in the uh, algorithmic in the algorithm's estimates, and it's spontaneous because it arises endogenously, without any intent to collude on the side of the people that design the algorithms and of the firms that deploy them. Moreover, we want to illustrate how spontaneous coupling can sustain various different types of collusion, not just. Uh, price fixing, but we will also discuss an example of market splitting. And then we will hint at how smart design choices and algorithm and market uh, point of views, points of view can happen, uh, can help in uh, addressing some of the challenges that algorithmic collusion poses. So let's just fix ideas. Today, when we talk about collusion, we mean basically any profile of actions such that the agents that play those actions enjoy a more profitable, uh, enjoy more profits than if they played static Nash equilibrium. This is a very wide ranging definition that encompasses, for example, multiple competitors that uh, set the same monopoly prices and therefore enjoy monopoly profits. We can have the, we have the case where the market of differentiated products is split among competitors so that each of them enjoys their local monopoly, or a more academic example. There might be cooperation in a prisoner's dilemma, where the two prisoners <laughs> decide to cooperate in this instead of the fact. And this is exactly what we want to start from to uh, fix ideas and work with a concrete example. 
And particularly, this is the game that we will be looking at. This is a classic prisoner's dilemma. Uh, there are two players, Alice and Bob, they keep their corporate of defect. And if you look at the payoff matrix, you see that defecting is a dominant strategy. It always gives you a higher payoff than cooperation, whatever your opponent does. And therefore, we would expect uh, that uh, any form of rational agents would learn to uh, or would play uh, the dominant strategy equilibrium. This is just an instance of a more general class of games, of more general class of prisoner's dilemma that we look at in the paper. But what happens if we now let algorithms play this game? Uh, well, as the title says, the algorithms learn to cooperate, but how? Well, let's consider an example, very simple one. Uh, there are two algorithms that play repeatedly this prisoner's dilemma. Every time they play, they obtain bandit feedback, which means that they only see the action that they've taken right now and the payoff that they received out of that. And let's suppose that they use epsilon greedy learning. Epsilon greedy learning is an algorithm whereby uh, the agents maintain a vector of values, one for each action in their action set, Whenever, uh, when they play, they update the value of the action that they played. Uh, and the update is a linear combination between the previous value and the value and the profit that they received out of playing uh, that action, while the values of the other actions remains fixed. How do they play? They use the, their estimates. With epsilon greedy in particular, uh, with probability one minus epsilon, they play the action that has the highest uh, estimate. And instead with probability epsilon, they just play an action at random. When we simulate these algorithms, something very surprising happens. The fraction of time they both cooperate with each other is 97%. So basically they always cooperate with each other. This is puzzling because we know that defection is a dominant strategy and we thought that dominant strategy is that kind of uh, action that we would always learn to play. However, if we plot the dynamics of the Q estimates, in this case of uh, Alice, we see even more puzzles because it seems like they are cooperating in cycles. The solid line, which is the value of cooperation is generally above the value of defection, but then at somehow regular intervals, uh, they switch to defection, they defect for a short period of time, and then they start cooperating again, and then they start defecting. And we really have, uh, at the beginning, we are really at, at a loss in explaining how these cycles might be happening because even if they resemble tip for tat strategies of repeated games, these algorithms do not carry a memory of their own past play and don't even observe the past play of the observe of the opponent. So it's not clear how they could be sustaining uh, such a uh, such a pattern. Well, we argue that these algorithms uh, end up cooperation end up cooperating because they are coupled, and the coupling that arises is spontaneous. And I want to describe, you know, carry you through a story. So suppose that Alice and Bob's estimate of cooperation are above that of defection. So most of the times they cooperate with each other because they are playing epsilon greedy. Most of the time they cooperate with each other and therefore the estimate of cooperation settles at a high value because cooperating when your opponent cooperates is the Pareto dominant action, uh, the Pareto dominant profile. However, every now and then they also play defection. And when defecting, when your opponent cooperates, gives you an even better payoff. So the value of defection over time rises and at some point must rise above the value of cooperation. When they start, when this happens, they start defecting on each other. But now defecting when my opponent defects as well gives me a very low payoff because we both go to jail. So we, uh, what happens is that the estimate of defection drops fast. At the same time, the estimate of cooperation falls much more slowly because we are experimenting with this only once in a while. So what happens is that over time, the value of defection falls below the value of cooperation and the cycle renews and we are back to cooperation. And you see that this simple example explains the cyclic structure, the quasi-cyclic structure uh, that we see in the figure to the right. Now, why is this happening? Well, it's happening because 
on most algorithms uh, keep track of the value of action AI say. However, in game theory, there is no such thing as the value of action A. What's well defined is the value of action A when the, op when the opponents play a certain profile of actions. Indeed, what mm, spontaneous coupling occurs when algorithms are too slow at reassessing the relative value of the actions when the action profile of the opponent changes. In other terms, they are slow at evaluating counterfactuals. That counterfactuals are so important in explaining uh, spontaneous coupling should not be surprising because counterfactual are at the core of strategic thinking. They are at the core of dominant strategy equilibrium and Nash equilibrium. And everything works very well when we are working with uh, rational agents, but algorithms are boundedly rational. They are not, they don't have the power, the thinking power that game theory agents are supposed to have. However, we can help algorithms estimate these counterfactuals. We can help them by designing them in a smart way, for example, unbiased learning, and we can help them by providing additional information so that even if they don't have a model of the environment, they can make estimates as if they had a model of the environment. And both these aspects are discussed at greater, much greater length in the paper. The central theorem of our work says that when algorithms learn at the same speed about all their actions, then coupling is guaranteed to disappear. And this, for example, implies that uh, in games of with a dominant strategy equilibrium, they will end up playing the dominant strategy equilibrium. And in games that can be solved by iterated elimination of dominant strategies, such as Bertrand pricing, they will learn to post uh, to, uh, to uh, post the price that correspond to Nash equilibrium. Now, this nice story about uh, spontaneous coupling is uh, seems appealing, but we also need to make sure that it's not just the feature of the prisoner's dilemma. Indeed, we want to argue that this is what underpins um, many of the cases of uh, algorithmic collusion that we see in the experimental literature. And even more so, this is peculiar to algorithmic markets because of their boundedly rational strategy mm. structure. So uh, what we are going to do now is work briefly over two examples, one of price, fix price fixing and one of market splitting. Price fixing is that case where uh, multiple firms uh, implicitly or explicitly agree on setting the same price higher than marginal cost so that they can make more profits. Market splitting instead is that situation where multiple firms decide to serve certain pockets of the market and the competitors stay out of the other people's pockets so that within each pocket they enjoy a local monopoly. So the first example of price fixing is based on the work by uh, Asker, Freshman, and Pekis. They consider two firms, let's say Alice and Bob, who sell homogeneous goods. They have the same marginal cost and they compete in prices. Let's say that they uh, pick their prices out of a grid of 100 numbers. In this case, there are two Nash equilibria because of discretization of the state space. And the authors wonder what happens when, instead of using rational agents, they use algorithms, and in particular, greedy Q-learning. They consider two specifications of greedy Q-learning. Asynchronous is the first one. In asynchronous greedy Q-learning, the agents, the firms, always pick the price with the highest estimate. And whenever they, and when they make updates, they only update that uh, price that they just took. The histogram below here shows the frequency of times that one price is the one that the price is learned uh, by uh, firms in independent runs of greedy Q learning. So they initialize independently Q learning every time and they observe what happens. As we can see, uh, Quite clearly, asynchronous learning results in posting prices higher than the Nash equilibrium that should be down here. 
However, if when they start, when they look at synchronous queue learning instead, they observe a totally different app. Synchronous queue learning it happens when you still pick the price that corresponds to the highest queue estimate, but then you have a model of the environment so that you can update all the values of all the prices at the same time. And now you, what they see is that they uh, converge on the Nash equilibrium. In light of our theorem, this can be easily explained. Uh, asynchronous queue learning is an instance of different speeds of learning. Because in one time, at one time, you at any one time, you just update the value of just one price. Synchronous queue learning is the the example of equal speeds of learning because everything is updated at the same time, always. And as our theorem says, when the, the speeds of learning are equal, we are guaranteed to find the Nash equilibrium at least in this setting uh, of pricing. Let's now move on to market splitting. With market splitting, we now uh, we all still have Alice and Bob, but now they have the possibility of bidding. They want to bid on three keywords, A, M, and B, each keyword having a random value. However, this, um, the click-through rates for each of these keywords are different. In particular, Alice enjoys has highest click-through rate for the word A and the lowest for the word B. And the inverse is for both. And instead, they have the same click-through rate for the word A, middle ground. Uh, the <clears throat> ads are uh, assigned through a second price option, and the players choose which subset of keywords to bid on and submit through full bids. Now, in this case, it is a dominant strategy to bid on everything because you don't pay for bidding. However, it is better, it would be better for them if they could coordinate and Alice only bids on her own branded keyword and then the uh, medium keyword, and Bob's instead only bids on his own uh, branded keyword, B, and also on the middle ground. This is an example of market splitting because they decide that they each concentrate on their quote-unquote core market. What happens if we simulate uh, this uh, an interaction in this setting? Well, we use epsilon greedy queue learning, and these histograms represent uh, the outcomes of 100 independent uh, epsilon Q, Q learning, epsilon greedy Q learning runs. As you can see, basically 40% of the times, Alice learns that she should only submit bids for uh, the keywords A and M, and Bob learns that, she, that he should only submit uh, bids for the keywords B and M. So they each separate, they separate the two markets and they concentrate and what matters and they don't compete with each other on their own branded keywords, which is what matters most for their revenues. So drawing to a conclusion, we have analyzed uh, a new mechanism that supports uh, collusion between uh, algorithms. It's called spontaneous coupling. This uh, mechanism relies on the behavioral nature of the algorithms. It doesn't require intent to collude, doesn't require communication, which means that the usual strategies that are used by regulators to ward off collusion will not work in this case. However, there are design choices that can address this. Design choices from the algorithmic point of view and from the market and mechanism design point of view. I invite you to have a look at the paper if you find this interesting. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.